Oh, nothing has been externally stimulated. This has all been from inside the White House from the top down. Joining us now, Pentagon correspondent for the New York Times, Helene Cooper. She's the author of a new book, Madam President, The Extraordinary Journey of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, which is on sale tomorrow. Great to have you on. Congratulations on the book. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Also with us, Chief Content Officer for Hearst Magazines, Joanna Coles. Good to have you back on the show. Thank you. Fun to be here. I couldn't help but notice in the past half hour that uh, the people that are being put out by the White House to clean up this in just mess doesn't even describe it are women. And I'm not proud. Take a look, Dan. Just so we're clear on this one specific point, is his information that President Obama tapped his phone based solely on something he read in the media? Yes or no? Look, I haven't had the chance to have the conversation directly with the president, uh, and he's at a much higher classification than I am, so he may have access to documents that I don't know about. He's the president of the United States. He has information and intelligence that the rest of us do not, and that's the way it should be for presidents. But again, if we don't know, then let's, let's find out together. Are these White House spokespeople? Or, I mean... Uh, how would you describe them? Joanna Coles, go. Well, I watched poor Sarah wrestling yesterday, but to be fair, she was wrestling with Martha Raddatz, so you do have right. women interrogating about it too. You're sitting on the other side of the desk. So I feel like this is a sort of equal opportunity slugfest at the moment, but I will say I went to see a horror movie yesterday afternoon, the new one by Jordan Peele, Get Out, and it felt like nothing compared to the actual horror show going on in Washington. I mean, it's like, how does popular culture respond Respond at a moment like this. You know, I have no interest any longer in seeing Homeland because it couldn't be as interesting as what's going on. And you think, how is anyone going to be able to compete with this? So, and Helene, I mean, I, I, is this, when you look at the job of the White House spokesperson and how history has shown them to be, are these two women representative of what we want? Are they doing their job? And exactly what is it they're doing? One of them I won't even have on this show. I don't envy them right now because they've got a tough product to try to sell, um, and that's that's got to be pretty pretty hard. Uh, you just notice that uh, <laughs> oh, we didn't see we didn't see her exactly backing up what uh, President Trump was saying, and that's that's got to be tough for them as well because I mean you're sitting you keep saying we don't know what we don't know. Well, the president actually tweeted that he did know, so that's a that's a tough that's a tough one to um, to try to sell. Well, and clearly they hadn't, he hadn't included them before he sent the tweet, right? So they had no forewarning. They had no idea what he was basing this on. And so, as you say, they're left to clear up the mess. But it's an acknowledgement that the White House convinced the president that he went too far because those two women are not out there freelancing and they're representing an attempt to walk it back against what he tweeted on Saturday. Walking it back, Joe, Sarah Huckabee almost laughing at herself as she's speaking. Well, I mean, what's so disturbing is that on Saturday morning, you had uh, Mike Barnacle, you had Donald Trump saying, I have just learned, I have just gotten information to prove that Barack Obama tapped my phones. Uh, he was very specific about it, that Obama d did it, that Trump Towers was tapped. And yet, in my calling around uh, Saturday morning, everybody that I talked to close to the president said they had no idea what he was talking about. They were chasing it down and they were trying to figure out what his sources were. Here we are, what, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, three days later, and Mike Barnacle, uh, they still don't know who the sources are. When I say Mike Barnacle, you should probably show Mike He's Barnacle's face. Thank you. That's a, that's the a second time I said Mike Barnacle. <laughs> Mike Barnacle. Here we are three days later. They still don't know who the sources are that the president used. That's, that's because he's obviously making it up. Well, Joe, this is day 45 of the Trump <laughs> presidency. Try and wrap your mind around that. Day 45. And as General Hayden alluded to earlier in this program, 
uh, he hasn't received a tickle internationally in terms of a real defined crisis. Not from Turkey, not from Syria really, not from North Korea or Pakistan, none of that has really tickled the internals of this administration yet. And here on day 45 we're dealing with a self-induced crisis brought on by the president himself. And Helene, uh, you've spent a considerable amount of time covering the Pentagon, getting to know the Pentagon and the personnel internally. What is the level of concern within the military establishment of the erratic behavior of the President of the United States? You know, we have a defense secretary now, Jim Mattis, who I was with him on his big trip a couple of weeks ago uh, to Europe and to Iraq uh, and to the Emirates, all of them uh, traditional American allies. And he spent an enormous amount of time doing reassuring. Uh, it was almost as if this was sort of the, the shadow government. This is the, the Trump administration that's not President Trump. You have Trump back at the White House, and then you have his, his government uh, abroad. Uh, Vice President Pence was there at the same time, uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, and everything that they said to the uh, to American allies abroad was, you know, don't pay attention to uh, what the president is saying at home. We're not going to pull out of NATO. We're not going to, we're not here. We got to Iraq, and uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis actually had to say, extraordinarily, we're not here to seize anybody's oil, uh, because President Trump, of course, had, had said that uh, before. So it's, you're, you're seeing, it's almost as if you're seeing two governments and people saying, don't pay attention attention to what the president is saying, but this is the president of the United States. Mm. You can't really do that because what he says counts. And I don't think, it seems almost as if he doesn't realize, he doesn't understand yet that what he tweets uh, carries the weight of the right. presidency of the well, United States. And what he did, and that's important. Joanna, is he accused former President Obama of a felony? Do you and called him sick. I wonder if he understood the full implications of that when he actually tweeted. Because there's something, the lack of discipline around how he tweets, the fact he's tweeting early in the morning, the two, um, you know, Jared and Ivanka, who are supposed to be the two restraining forces of him, we hear don't pay attention on a Saturday because they're celebrating the, the Sabbath. So you see this sort of erratic, reckless tweeting. Did he actually understand how serious it was to accuse the former president of breaking the law? What and do you I, think? I, well, I'm not entirely sure he does because he makes a whole thing about not understanding Washington, not caring about this stuff. He's here to disrupt. And the casualness with which he does it makes me think he doesn't fully understand the implications. He understands because he's a TV guy and he lived with ratings and I thought Michael Hayden's point earlier about he lives in the eternal now was a very good one and what he's looking for is something to distract now without understanding the full implications. Yeah. Joe, what do you think? Mika, he, Mika I, yeah, I'm curious what you think. I, I think he just doesn't care. All he wants to do is blow something up as big of an explosion as possible to distract from other things. Yeah. Uh, and and it's just he has absolutely no impulse control because he doesn't have a long game or a mid medium game. Everything is a short game. Everything it, it, it proves he's a day trader and he does live in the eternal now. So he does he doesn't care. He doesn't right. care about who he blows up or who he hurts. And as I said at the beginning of this show, you know, I wasn't, did not, I thought this presidency could happen. I thought he could win. It's certainly not my first choice. But I wanted to have hope and I wanted to have an open mind so that perhaps the weight of this office, of this presidency, might guide him in a better direction than in his previous life. It is not. Well, it is now. And you even had, it you is even now, had Peggy Noonan this past weekend, Mika, yeah. uh, talk about, the, I think rightly, right about the president's speech, talked about how Donald Trump tried to normalize himself. The president gave an almost traditional presidential speech that even had liberals saying that he was now the president. Well, and then, of course, we were all concerned, say, well, let's wait for the tweets. And, of course, the very, tweets very came. Very, very low bar. The speech no can be described control. that way. And Joe, then the tweets came. So. Joe, w w one, of, one of the issues that I we're talking about here that, that is now on the table, has been on the table all morning long, and you just defined it, you just described a sitting president of the United States totally unprepared for the job of being president. 
We're totally unprepared for the job of being president, unfortunately, not knowing what he does not know. And possibly uh, unfit uh, mentally. Sorry. Well, I'm just uh, saying what everyone's and thinking. He, so. he, he, he will not ha put around him people around him that can discipline him. And in fact, this is the most disturbing part. He selects the most dangerous person. Right. The guy who says he's a Leninist, who wants to destroy the government. Yeah. Guy who says he's a Leninist, who he wants to bring everything crashing down. That is who he turns to in his time of crises. And that's exactly what we're getting, somebody who is bringing down our government. Look at the editorial I, of the, 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 the Wall Street Journal today, yeah. talking about that there, is, there are now basic questions about U.S. institutions and trust in government. Yep. Uh, it, this is this is Helene. This is about as serious it, it seems as it's gotten at least since the days of Watergate, as far as trust in government goes, isn't it? Um, I hesitate to say that because um, the second you do, you're going to be. We're going to be. I'm going to be reminded of some other instance. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to put on you're my put it on hold. Th yeah. Let's put it this way. I, I I believe in his ability to communicate with people, and I believe in how he won. I get why he won. Um, I don't believe in his ability to be able to do this job well. It's it's past time that we lower the bar so low that, we're in, the, that we're in the ditch. Well, um, I mean, it feels crueler. The tweets yesterday or on Saturday felt crueler because you'd had this teaser of the speech to Joint Congress where you thought, oh, maybe, maybe. We can hear, me. Joanna, from people from other countries who say this is how it starts. <laughs> So right. I think we're at that point where we have to have that conversation. Well, I think there are and a lot of people very worried in Europe. I mean, Britain is watching this like a soap opera. And, and others are watching it uh, with historic knowledge of how things go terribly wrong. Helene, you wrote this book um, in part uh, thinking you'd be talking about this book when there would be a Madam President, which I think engraves just how... What's the word? How, how much a Hillary Clinton presidency was anointed in our minds? And that's, by the way, why we're here with President Trump. But tell us about this great leader. Uh, well, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is the president of Liberia. She was the first woman elected president of an African country. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's this is a book about how the women of Liberia actually did it. Um, and it could actually serve as sort of a model for uh, an American uh, story as well. I certainly, the whole while I was working on the book, I thought it was going to come out as we had a female Male president uh, here in the United States, so it's sort of a little. It's a uh, for a lot of women who hope that I think is a little bit bittersweet. But this is an extraordinary story of sort of the lengths that Liberian women went through to get a woman elected. These are women who had come through 15 years of insane civil war. The civil war in Liberia makes you know normal wars look crazy. You had child soldiers, you had children who were kidnapped from their mothers and drugged and forced to take up arms against their own families. 70% of the country, the 70% of the women there believed to have been raped. It was horrific. And at the end of this, the women sort of having looked over a cliff just took control hmm. any way they could. They used many crooked methods. They were completely down and dirty. They got down in the dirt with the men and flung their own dirt. And at the end of this, you have this 67-year-old grandmother emerging out of the ashes of this country. And it's sort of of an extraordinary story, particularly looking at what the women did to get her get her elected. Incredible. The book is Madam President, The Extraordinary Journey of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Helene Cooper, thank you so much. Joanna, stay with us if you can. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.